Go. Good morning, and welcome to the fifth Sunday of Lent from St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Essex Fells, New Jersey. We welcome all of you who are watching on this video recording of our service for the last proper Sunday in Lent, Sunday before Palm Sunday. And as we did last week, for those of you who are here, the small group that is here, and for those of you at home, We'll begin with a wonderful prelude, which will allow us to prepare our hearts and minds. And I might uh, point out to you that there is uh, on the St. Peter's website, a copy of the liturgy for the Sunday. And there is a meditative uh, version of Psalm 91, which you can take with you through the week in these challenging times. So now let us prepare a heart and mind by listening to this inspiring prelude played by our organist, John Farnock. <laughs> And now let us worship God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed, Blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sin. His mercy endures forever. Beloved in Christ, we have come together in the presence of God to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to pray for ourselves, each other, and the world so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him. Let us kneel or stand in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may receive the assurance of forgiveness that comes from his infinite goodness and mercy. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults, Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. 
Lord, have mercy upon us. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, for true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us hear the word of God. The first lesson is from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and you will, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your current graves and bring you up from these graves. O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall, shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be reading Psalm 130. I will read to the asterisk and you can respond uh, thereafter. Out of the depths I have called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note that this is done amiss, O Lord, oh, Lord who could stand? stand? For there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, Therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his sins. The second lesson is from Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 11. To set the mind on carnal desire is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on carnality is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in such carnal captivity cannot please God. But you are not so captive. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is deadened because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. 
He who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your sin-deadened mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said to his disciples, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Judean leaders were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. 
Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said that, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. These are times when the common good of the community knocks at the door and I hope is tugging at all our hearts. Yesterday on a walk on a very beautiful day, I went by the local Roman Catholic church and then went around the corner to the barber shop where I go regularly. On the door, of the church was one response to the fact that people are not meeting for worship. As you may know, the Archbishop of Newark has ordered all Roman Catholic churches closed and locked. And so on the door of the church was a, was a large placard that said, the Archbishop has ordered all churches closed and locked until this crisis is over. We are very sorry. Then I went to the barbershop, which was likewise closed. And the sign said, among other things, we intend to do whatever we can to help slow the spread of this virus and therefore will be closed until the crisis has passed. We are all in this together and will emerge stronger. Now, I'm not saying against anything against the local Monsignor, whom I know is actually a very good pastor, but the emphasis of what he said was we've been, we've been told to shut down. I understand it, I'm not being critical about it, I just notice it's one angle to approach the situation we're in. Whereas the good Roman Catholic boy, uh, not a boy anymore, but Barber, who went to Seton Hall, 
had the essence of the Roman Catholic social ethic in his message. We intend to do whatever we can to slow the spread of this virus. The common good has knocked at our door with demands and opportunities. And as I think you all realize, sheltering at home and going out as little as possible is a practice of protecting other people in community. It's a practice of community. It's a practice of being in community. That which is a deprivation is also an opportunity, which is the theme I keep hitting. And it's appropriate that this is happening during Lent, entirely accidentally, because the practice of community is central to the way of Christ. And all of the things we think of as our personal practices contribute to the life of community, even if it's only prayer discipline. Because prayer discipline changes us, and it changes the way we are with other people. So we can hope that this reality of the Archbishop and everybody else focusing things to be closed is an opportunity to rebalance what is a, a major imbalance in our culture at this point. And that is the privileging of individual self-expression over communal value. Now, I'm a big fan of individual self-expression. I've been doing it my entire, uh, um, uh, uh, my entire adult life. I am a bit of a maverick as a priest and a person, but I know where the lines are. When I'm coloring, I sometimes color a little outside the lines, but I maintain my sense both as a priest who's obedient to the wisdom of the bishop and obedient to the norms of the church to be creative in relationship to those bounds, to be personally expressive in relationship to those bounds. Now the scriptures today are more about community practice. That, that's, a, that's an essential part of them. And the scriptures as a whole are more about community practice than individual salvation. And the, and the lessons speak of the social reality we take for granted at our peril. Ezekiel speaks the hope of a national resurrection. This passage was later taken to describe the, the resurrection of the just at the end of the age. But in this particular passage, he's addressing Israel in exile, where people are really concerned that the community will perish that the sons and daughters will be lured away by Babylonian pagan culture, that they'll marry out of the Jewish community, and that the entire culture and its religion and its relationship to God will be lost. They feel like dry bones. And this vision, command to prophesy, is addressing the national spirit of discouragement, fear, and the danger, the real danger of extinction. So it's a really important passage for our time, where there are so many fears about the economy and about people's jobs, and, and how will we ever recover from this? Plagues have come and gone. We do recover, which is not to minimize the damage being done. And Israel does miraculously come back. The resurrection really does happen. And with it is born the belief in the ultimate resurrection of the just at the end of the ages, which Martha speaks of in her response to Jesus. Now, Paul addresses the Christian community in Rome, not merely as individuals, but as a group tightly banded together in the midst of a pagan world to practice something different, to practice being together in a different way. And all of this stuff about dealing with the carnal nature, the liter and literally it says the flesh, but the that gets misunderstood as simply fleshly desires. What he means is, is what we all have to do. It's what we all have to do as we grow up. It's what we all have to do to be in community. We can't just kick up our heels and do anything we want anytime. 
we have to keep our impulses on a short leash. And we have to train them to work cooperatively with other people. It's not that our impulses are bad, it's that they need training. Like children, one of the major realities of, of childhood training is what's appropriate to say and do at certain times within one's culture. And so he's really speaking something about how they live together, restraining their anger, restraining their jealousy, restraining their divisiveness, restraining their violence. And when we get to the gospel, Jesus is in the community of his friends. Mary and Martha are close friends. It says he loves Lazarus. There are only three places in the entire New Testament where the Gospels talk about Jesus loving someone. He clearly loves the beloved disciple, whom we think is the Apostle John. He said to love Lazarus. And in the Gospel of Mark, he loves the rich young man who comes to him and wants to seek eternal life. Now, Jesus' love is unquestioned, but he had particular friends. And this young man, he took a shine to because he knew that he had real potential. So here is Jesus in the community of his friends. Maverick as he is, he's not a soloist. He's working in concert with other people. He also is concerned about the whole community of Israel, which is represented by the Jews who have come, the Judeans who have come from Jerusalem to this prominent suburb, an Essex Fells or short hills of, of ancient Jerusalem, a suburb of Jerusalem, to mourn the death of uh, a man in a prominent family. Now, there's a different way of approaching society, which is very deep in the heart of a certain stream of American consciousness, whereas communal barn raising is in the other stream of communal cooperation. And it was voiced by the famous Iron Lady of England, Maggie Thatcher, when she said, I'm learning we're not, there's no such thing as society. No such thing as society, she said. There's only individuals and families. All the rest is illusion. Well, that last piece is mine, but it's an interpretation of what she said. Now she did go on to say, I'll give her credit. It is our duty to look after ourselves and then also to look after our neighbors. Stops a bit short. We depend on larger systems and society itself, its norms, its standards, its laws, all of the organizations in society, the policemen, the firemen, doctors, the nurses. I'm sorry, Thatcher, I'm not talking about the rest of your politics. I'm talking about your Anglicanism stop short. We are persons in community much more than we are individuals. Individuals makes us this kind of singular solitary slot in the larger machine of society. But we're cells in a body as Paul tells us. And as Paul says, we are members of one another. Our very personalities are formed out of the impressions of the people we meet, especially in young childhood. We carry our mother and our father in us in ways that are both helpful and sometimes hindrances. We are shaped by the people we love. We get imprints all the time. Even our personalities in the supposedly individual selfhood are composite and are made up of links of other people, as well as the way our own distinctive particular personalities are filtered through this social grid to make us uniquely and distinctly who we are. 
that we are distinct persons, each of us valuable, but in relationship to other people. When Jesus gives the cup at the Last Supper, he says, this cup is my blood, my life-giving spirit, my life itself, shed for you and the many, is what the Greek says. Now we can hear that and think it's just for the disciples and for all of us, and to a certain extent that's true, but the many with a capital M is a code word for you disciples and the whole of the disciple community, for the whole of the disciple community, you and the whole people of Israel, but even more importantly, for the people of Israel and for the nations, the many are the great nations of the world. So he gives his life for the life of the world. So even at the Lord's Supper, we're not just receiving something for ourselves, we're receiving it in concert with the whole church, but on behalf of the whole world, that our growth in love, our growth in holiness, our growth in the sense of justice, our growth in the sense of fairness, our investing in deepening our taproot into God have effects. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And part of that grace, the active grace of God, which is at work through us if we give ourselves over and trust to the path of Jesus, is resurrection power. I am resurrection right here and now. I am the force of resurrection, of standing up again in the midst of any time of being knocked down, of standing up again from sickness and death, of standing up against, again from abuse, of standing up again even in the midst of injustice. I am that power which allows you to stand up again. That's what resurrection means in Greek. I am it right now. I carry it within me. And the Christ within us, which is a reality for all of us who are on the path of Christ. As Paul says in his epistle, that Christ is in us. That is the power of standing up again in us, which is breathed into us moment by moment by the Holy Spirit of God. We will get through this, most of us. There will be resurrection. But we can use this time to reflect on how we practice being persons in community and reflect on how the community of family, church, town, nation makes and keeps us human, makes and keeps us growing, makes and keep us ourselves. Amen. And now, let us stand and join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the time of our distress, we call upon the shepherd of the entire human family, who formed us in the divine image and called us in Christ, baptized us into his own solidarity with vulnerable humanity, and appointed us his holy priesthood to make intercession for the whole world. And so we, and so we pray, in your mercy, Lord, 
for the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, that we may walk the way of Christ with renewed intention, deepening the life of Christ within us. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For our Bishop Carly, for priests and deacons and all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God, that the mission of Christ may go forward among us in new ways. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For the leaders of peoples and nations, especially our President Donald, our Governor Philip, that they may seek the safety and well being of all and serve the common good. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For all the peoples of the earth who live in this miracle of intertwined life, that we may be delivered from pestilence, flood, famine, and the heedless destruction of God's creation. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For our families, friends, companions, neighbors, and all those we love, especially for those celebrating birthdays, Emily Blake, Mike Camel, Claire Grothius, and Jennifer Jackson. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. The hungry and homeless, for the sick and suffering, especially Marilyn Dickerson, Brad Arrington, Helen Giajari, Wayne Hill, Fred Jenkins, Tanya Jenkins, Eddie Kay, Catherine Kamen, Gloria Kelly, Katie King, E.J. Sabel, ill with the virus, Lauren L. and Lorianne, with thanksgiving for restored health for Kyle Perkins. In your mercy, Lord. For all who are tempted, oppressed, afflicted, confused, afraid, or lost in darkness of any kind. In your mercy, Lord. For those who rest in Christ and for all the departed, that they may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service, especially Catherine Bishop, mother of Pam Bayard, who died this week. In your mercy, Lord. O oh God, our refuge and strength at all times, we thank you that your heart of mercy is always open for those who call upon you in trust and love. Shower healing and compassion on the sick and sustain those who care for them. Soothe the suffering, guide the perplexed, shield the joyous, and all for your name's sake. And now joining our prayers to the eternal prayer of Christ, which presents us in the whole world to the Father, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, I want to welcome you to this online service, which we will continue for the duration of this crisis. Next week is Palm Sunday, and we plan to be bringing you a service, but we will also be making known to you diocesan resources. There is a plan that there are diocesan services in a variety of churches which will be webcast during Holy Week. And on Easter Sunday, the bishop will be preaching at one of our churches and celebrating the Eucharist. Next Sunday, we plan to have not only a service of word and prayer, but to have a celebration of the Holy Communion for the small group gathered here. And we need to understand as Episcopalians in concert with the rest of the church, that in the Eucharist, we join the eternal self-offering of Christ to the Father. Not in some propitiatory sacrifice to avert the wrath of God, but presenting all of humanity to God, opening us as the mediator between God and man to the grace of God flowing into the world. And so even though we will not be present physically, to receive the sacrament. In good Anglican tradition, we can feed on Christ in our hearts in this prayerful moment. 
So that will be going on next Palm Sunday and St. Peter's services. And now uh, I invite our senior warden, uh, Frank Butterfield, uh, to say a few words. Hi, I'd like to thank all those who have joined us uh, today for this worship service on the fifth Sunday of Lent. Um, our prayers go out to you and your families as we you know, continue to um, deal with the uh, changes that have happened in our routines. Uh, wanted to remind the congregation that um, you could help support the uh, ministry here uh, by remembering to include uh, your weekly offering, uh, if you are able. Um, you can do so online through the church website. Uh, there's a donate button to the left on the left side menu, uh, or you could send your offering in if you're able to put it into the mail safely. Um, thank you. Again, as Frank uh, says, as you are able, we understand that people's situations vary very much. But do understand that St. Peter's is still in business. Toby, uh, uh, our buildings manager, Toby West, is busy doing all kinds of things to paint and clean and fix up and repair. Our secretary uh, is working mostly from home, but she's coming uh, over to the office three days a week to pick up some of the donations that have been coming in by mail, thank you very much, uh, and to consult about the Sunday services. Uh, our pastoral assistant, uh, Sue Negrado, is uh, busy at work calling people uh, remotely, by telephone mostly, to take care of those she usually pastors to. Then our vestry has initiated a phone tree to gradually get in touch with people throughout the parish. So life is going on at St. Peter's, even though our doors will be closed. Coming the next week, we're going to follow the example of the Roman Catholic Diocese, and the church will not be open for daily prayer between Monday and Friday. Um, I, with the Monsignor, I say we're very sorry about that. And with my hairdresser, uh, I'm going to say uh, we're doing all we can to flatten the curve. Um, so both of them have a point. And now, um, we have a moment of peace. I invite you to silence in which you can even envision the people you love, people you know at the church, the wider society I've been talking about, and send them light and peace. Now I direct you to the prayer that's in your online bulletin, which we say together. O oh God, who has taught us that in quietness and confidence shall be our strength, let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts and be shed abroad through us as a blessing for all who cross our path. Amen. And now we're actually gonna sing a hymn in your online bulletin. There is the text of Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, great evangelical hymn from the, uh, the great evangelical revival of the uh, 1800s. And we will sing it together and you're invited to sing it at home. <laughs> Thank you. 
you to bow your heads for a prayer over the people. Gracious Lord, watch over your faithful people as they walk the pathway of Christ in this Lenten season, bringing forth in them through faith and practice the fruits of your grace at work in them more than they know or can imagine. And may your love, O oh God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in peace, and the peace of God be with you. Thanks be to God. And now to end our service, and as a transition back into the world of ordinary life, our organist John Pabarnik will play postal for us. <laughs> Thank you.